Hello there, Mr. Lee here. Today we're going to talk about Horace, um, who is an author we are to study in as part of the Roman city life of our classical civilization course. He's the author of several books of satires, and um, that's what we're going to be studying today. Satires, um, he's, he wrote other books as well, but we're going to focus on his set of satires. Now, Horace is Mr. Lee's favorite author, and um, just love his poetry love his poetry. He grew up in a small town, made it big in Rome, enjoys country life, makes his point by being sarcastic. He's understated, he often is quite subtle in what he, in the points that he wants to make, um, and often the subtlety that he uses makes it more memorable. Um, sometimes he's quite blunt as well actually, to be fair. He's moralistic, he has a certain agenda, um, he wants to make certain moral points and he's a successful manipulator of words. And if you look at Mr. Lee, Mr. Lee has clearly got uh, quite a few of these qualities, just not quite the success yet, yet, maybe one day. Um, more about Horace. He's from Venusia in the far south of Italy. He is far away from the big cities. He's far south of Naples. Um, so yeah, he's not really in the center of action at all where he was born and he supported the losing side in the civil war. Pretty bad start, but um, you, you know, you, you often expect people to be on the losing side to be at risk of being killed as well. But he was pardoned by the first emperor Augustus and he was, he became a client of Mycenas, who is someone very trusted by Augustus and he, he's a very literary sort of man. Um, Mycenas were patrons of several notable poets of the time and Mycenas provided Horace with a villa and a farm 25 miles outside Rome. Um, so what we'll see in Satires 2.2 and 2.6 is that Horace loves the country living. He wrote these satires after the farm was provided for him to him and so perhaps the satires that we're about to read 2.2 and 2.6 are inspired um, or made possible by the uh, filler gift that Mycenas had provided. Um, he likes to call his satires sermones which means conversations and um, he just basically likes you to be comfortable when his satires are recited or indeed in the modern context when the satires are being read by you. He does that by adopting a very chatty register. When I say register here I mean the sort of language or the style of language that you use. You might have a formal register, you might have a very informal casual register. Here he goes for a register that's very conversational, chatty, and he it makes you feel like you're being spoken to in a small group conversation, it makes you feel comfortable, right? Um, and, you know, if you imagine yourself being at a sort of dinner party and someone tries to strike up a conversation with you and give their opinion, Hor Horace's satires is it? And he likes to give an opinion, but he's never terribly direct, not at least to start off with. He likes to lighten the blow of any opinion that he has. We're on that second major bullet point, on that first sub bullet point there. He likes to lighten the blow of potential criticism. He doesn't necessarily like to attack other people. And you know, if he does, he does it implicitly rather than directly. And I think sometimes when you don't call a spade a spade, you actually make a point more memorable because you have to think about it. But his points are also memorable because they're meant to be funny. Sometimes when you exaggerate a certain truth, it's meant to make things more funny. Um, you know, like the fact that actually Mr. Lee is spending far more time creating lessons for you now, even though we're during lockdown. Um, it's quite bizarre, isn't it? I don't know. I don't think I'm going to make it as a comedian, so I'm just going to move on. He exaggerates ridiculous customs and he recognizes that people can be flawed. He, the way that he pokes fun at it is often actually highly exaggerated certain things. Like maybe in your daily life you're just getting on with it and you don't spot certain things that are ridiculous, but he talks about these things in isolation 
and um, uh, and it really makes you reflect on it and go, ha, ah, I've never really thought about that before. He also recognizes that, you know, when he when he pokes fun at certain things, he, his point is not to go, ha, ah, look at you, how silly you look. No, not far from it. His point is that actually any one of us can be put in that situation or can behave in that certain way that is ridiculous. Um, and so actually we need to perhaps on the, be on the lookout for it, but not be too harsh on the people who are in that situation either. He composes for an audience of elites. So just bear that in mind. Um, a lot of the things that he points out are often more relevant to people who are um, in his social circle, in his standing. And by the time when he wrote these satires, he's quite high up in Roman society. And he is a poet. So whatever he writes, or at least in the original Latin, whatever he writes has a meter, has a rhyme. If I could just direct your attention away from the picture to the quotes there. What Horace says in Satas 1.1 is that when someone, when what stops someone from telling the truth while smiling? As teachers sometimes give children cookies to tempt them to learn the alphabet. I think what he's ba basically saying is a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down, the medicine go down, the medicine go down. Um, in the most delightful way, presumably. Uh, you, you know, you, you could be helped to understand certain points um, by using some sweetener, by using some humour, by using some bribery, perhaps. Um, hopefully you won't need any cookies in order to do this lesson and maybe a cookie would help, but you need to provide your own. So um, if you need to pause it now and go get some, go get some. Um, but make sure you do your work because it's reward, it's payment, it's not free. Um, so, Horace is saying that these points are better made if they aren't just like forced down someone's throat, if you like. Uh, to stretch to stretch you a little bit, to challenge you a little bit, you remember that the word satire literally means a plate full of stuff. And it's quite interesting that he uses this food analogy there. Um, but he just says, yeah, um, you know, giving children some cookies to help them learn alphabets. Well, that is the point of satire. You're serving up dishes of truth, um, garnished and sweetened for other people to eat it all up and hopefully gain something from it other than weight. Three satires to read, 2.2, 2.6, 2.8, country life, city life, dinner parties, that sort of thing. Now, um, I said Horace has a sort of agenda. Um, I don't mean that in a rude way. I think whenever we say things, we often have an agenda. If you answer questions in my lesson, maybe your agenda is to avoid the awkward silence <laughs> or um, to improve your learning and other people's learning. Fine, that's an agenda. Um, but sometimes the answers that Horace gives to the phenomena that he sees um, shows evidence of Epicureanism. Now, Epicureans believe that the purpose of life is to have simple pleasures and to avoid worrying as much as possible. Okay? Um, and I think that actually, you know if I've told you RS that my job is not to force ideology down your throat and force you to believe it, but to give you something that you might be interested in um, following in your life. And I think this is a le lesson that's worth following is to enjoy the small things in life. And you can achieve that according to Epicureans by ensuring that you don't have extreme emotions. You tr you know, it, it's not about anger, but on the other hand, it's not about laughing your head off 24 hours seven. It's about something in the middle. It's that balanced emotion um, and you avoid extremes. And you know, within that middle zone, between those extremes, you find enjoyment in things. I think these are quite wise words in many ways, though obviously you can choose to disagree as well. Um, some quotes from Horace over time. Yeah, Cease the day, I'm sure you've heard that one. Um, never despair, I'm sure you've tried that one. That sort of thing. I wonder which of these quotes are your favorite quotes. 
which of these quotes you'd carry with you. Like these are the sort of quotes that you might just tattoo on your arm. Although, um, yeah, you, it's, you're you not at the age where you can tattoo yet. And Mr. Lee doesn't advocate that in the slightest. Um, some of these quote, uh, quotes are actually quoted by later authors. Like, for example, it is sweet and honorable to die for one's country. I think it was Wilfred Sassoon, um, the um, First World War poet, who quoted that. Horace was actually being um sarcastic or he was being he 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 was saying it but not that's not actually what he believes he is almost mocking it by giving that quote so in a way when he was quoted in the first world war uh he was misquoted it was out of context um horace never believed that so yeah still um I don't think that necessarily detracts from the First World War poems appreciation. Anyway, let me know which one of these ones you think are um, most suitable for you. One that you carry around with you and so you can seize it and use it. And um, I hope you gain some life lessons by studying Horace's satire.